My name is Jason. I would like to give my testimony. I basically uh, was born, raised in St. Louis, Missouri. I live with my mom, single mom. And, uh, you know, basically, I remember thinking about God when I was like nine or ten. I heard some uh, arguments about the rapture. So you start thinking about eternity ever since I was nine or ten. And then uh, basically in college, high school, college, I joined the Church of Christ. So I was baptized, believe in Jesus. Uh, but I dropped out and came to L.A. And uh, basically in L.A., just went from relationship to relationship. Different women I had children. And uh, today I have four children. They are with different women. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, basically tell you that my life was chaos, you know. It's basically going from putting out fires in my life, financial fires, legal fires, obviously relationships with my children and their moms. And then uh, basically I was in an apartment right here on Redondo in Gardena, Torrance. And uh, I was in my apartment on a Saturday, you know, just basically mm -hmm. wasting the day away. Mm -hmm. and someone knocked on my door. I was a little scared, like, oh, you know, what is this, the landlord? So I go to the, see who it is. And I answered the door and he started telling me about Jesus. And uh, at that time I was basically considering Judaism and uh, you know, still looking for God. But uh, he told me about Jesus and you know, gave his testimony. And I just listened, but I always have a slight uh, discussion. And he stayed with me like 45 minutes telling me his testimony and how much it was important to really believe in Jesus. Because you know, obviously Judaism, they do not believe in Jesus. So, he left after 45 minutes and I went back, took a shower, but I heard music coming from across the street at the park. And the music was gospel music, praise and worship music, and it just basically got into my heart and into my soul and really basically almost convicted me right there, but I knew that I needed to go across the street. So, you know, I went across the street and they had a little church in the park and I sat in the back row and a gentleman came up to me and asked me the same question. Do you know where you'll go if you die today? And I didn't know. So he said, well, do you, do you want to give your life to Jesus? I said, yes. And so I did sinner's prayer. And uh, ever since then, I've been coming to the Door of Christian Fellowship right here in Gardena, California. And I just want to tell you that, you know, Jesus changes, changed my life completely. I was basically, like I said, putting out fires. You know, every year I would lose my car and have to get another car. Every couple of years, I lose an apartment and I, you know, spend some time homeless, you know, like a week or so. So, you know, but ever since I've given my life to Jesus and just coming to church and really plugging in and listening to the sermons, I basically allow Jesus to come into my life, the Holy Spirit. And on a daily basis, I basically, you know, learning daily through discipleship, fellowship and all the great things that Jesus has brought into my life. And I haven't been dealing with those fires anymore as much as before. And now I just really have a hope for the future, you know, because you do get hopeless after a while. But after Jesus came to my life, I basically, you know, really feel that there's a potential for my life if I stick with it and really believe and, and keep in coming to church and praying and, and living out that godly life that God called us to. And that's my testimony. Praise God. God is a miracle working God. We want to welcome you out to our live stream this evening, and we're thankful for what God's doing in Jason's life. We're thankful for what God's doing in your life. We're thankful for all the people that are here. We're thankful for a God that just takes good care of us. We're going to start, we're going to sing a little song, I sing a few songs uh, uh, this evening, and so you join with us. If you're there in your home, just stand up, sing like a normal service would be, and we're going to lift up the name of Jesus. Uh, we're going to sing that song, Every Knee Shall Bow. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord forever. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord forever. Can't stop. Praising his name, I just can't stop. Praising his name, I just can't stop. Praising his name of Jesus. Can't stop. Praising his name, I just can't stop. Praising his name, I just can't stop. 
I pray for our president and all the leaders all over the world that are making the tough decisions today. We want to pray for every in every crisis, that every leader, in every nation, in every household, you look at, to Jesus Christ because that's the only place to go inside of a crisis. We want to pray for our first responders. We want to pray for those people also uh, that are on the front lines, our frontline responders, our healthcare professionals, our doctors, uh, our nurses. We want to believe God to really help them, the professionals that are there. They're doing their best to win this war against the virus that we're facing. We want to pray for all the churches that are also doing their best. Uh, and, and I've been, you know, I've, for two weeks I was just watching services and just so impressed with each church that's trying to do what they can do. On the way here, I was watching uh, Marty Carnegie there in the Metro Atlanta Center, and he's preaching on a, a never changing God in an ever changing world. There's just been so much really good preaching. Uh, I, I've, I've listened to Pastor Campbell. I'm trying to post them on Facebook. I, I'm not even sure how to post things many times, but I'm trying the best I can to get some great preaching out there. So take your time, your home, listen to several of them. You know, I, I really encourage you to do that. We want to pray for you, especially uh, you that are home in your family uh, and uh, you're watching this, uh, that you won't just watch it, that you'll participate in this, that you'll sing along with us, you'll let that presence of God begin to enter your home, you'll lift your hands, you'll praise, you'll begin to comment. You're most welcome to comment on anything uh, that you would normally do in a church service. You say amen or whatever you want to feel like doing. You can't say that in here. You're more than welcome uh, to do that online. Uh, <clears throat> so we really encourage you to do that. Uh, also, we want to encourage you in giving. We're going to be taking the offering. That's all part of the liturgy of the church. It's all part of the order of service that God has laid down that ushers in the presence of God. When you praise God, you worship God, that brings His presence as you reach down and you do something financially recognizing what God has given to you. That does something in your life, and God's heart is moved by that. And I've been very, very encouraged by those that continue to give, whether it's online or whether they've come by and given a check. They've just, uh, let me tell you, your ties are keeping us alive. <laughs> your offerings are keeping us alive. And so we uh, encourage all of you and all of your churches to do that wherever you are. Support your pastor. Support the, the ministry that's there. And I encourage you to do that. The blessing that God brings him and the hope that he brings. As Jason was speaking, his life was hopeless. That's what the world is looking at. A hopeless end. And we have that endless hope in Jesus Christ. And so there are several ways that you can give. And uh, we want to encourage you to do just that. You can go to the door, CFC. Uh, the door SB and uh, sba4j.com. You can go right there. There's an online giving button. You can click on that online giving button, uh, and uh, uh, another tab will come up uh, where you can quite easily uh, navigate that and, and um, bring that to pass. That will be a great blessing to us here. You can, as I say, you can also come by in the mornings uh, anytime uh, after six o'clock until about eight. I'm here. And I would encourage you uh, to do that uh, whenever you can as well. Let's, let's just praise God right now. Father, we love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord God.
again, we're just trying the best we can to work it all out. So the words of Jesus are going to speak here tonight in, in the scripture that we're going to read. If you go to Luke chapter 22, uh, you can begin there with me in a moment. But uh, he's going to change the whole liturgy of the whole Passover. That's what we celebrate here. We're celebrating the last Passover. We're celebrating the last supper. We're celebrating the first communion. We're also celebrating the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. And that's what really takes place in a communion service. And, and this is radical. I mean, these words were repeated by the head of the household every year, once a year at the Passover, they would do that. And then uh, for another 2,000 years, the, the Jews would still repeat it. Tonight, they're repeating it. It's a full moon tonight. Tonight's the Passover. They're repeating these words out of Exodus that Jesus is going to change because he's going from a religion to a relationship with him, and he's doing that. And so uh, they set up the Passover table. There was five cups, and no one's ever drank from the fifth cup. 3,500 years, and it's the largest of all the Passover cups, and it's put in the middle of the table, and sometimes it's called Elijah's cup. But before we take communion tonight, I want you thinking about the five cups, and I want you thinking about five things. I want you to think about the last Passover, I want you to think about the last supper, I want you to think about the first communion, I want you to think about the first coming of Jesus, and I want you to think about the second coming of Jesus. So we're going to go to that video.
Jesus, they don't feel like they're worth it. But he doesn't save us because we're worth it. He saves us because he's worthy. He saves us because he's worthy and he's worth it. And you mean everything to Jesus. And so I want to preach to you out of the book of Luke in chapter 22. And I want to start there and, uh, and begin verse 13. Uh, it says, So when they went out, they found it just as he had said to them. And they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles were with him. Then he said to them, with a fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup. This is the cup. He gave thanks and he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you that I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread. He gave thanks and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper. This is another cup. This is a, a second cup he's talking about. This cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is on the table. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus, we come to you tonight in the wonder and the glory of all that communion brings to us. Father, we thank you. Oh, give us an understanding of that fifth cup, O oh Lord. Minister to us tonight and tell us all that you want us to say, all you want us to be, all you want us to do. Let our hearts be filled with your goodness and with your favor in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to talk to you about the first three cups. Their significance to us as Christians and not Jews. Jesus was a Jew. And he was bringing the Jew to the Christian significance and the Christian experience. Every Old Testament ritual has, some, uh, has within it the revelation and the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the person and the relationship that he wants you and I to have with. They were all pointing to Jesus as the Messiah. It doesn't make any difference whether you talk about the, the sacrificial lamb. It doesn't make any difference if you talk about the bread that he's breaking, his body that was broken and beaten for you and I, for the healing that he brings. Everything that you see is there. With the five cups, every one of those cups are significant. As it says, I'm going to go into them a little bit more. Tithing, offering, salvation, all of those things all have something to do. The altar that we come and pray at, everything that we have going on, the cloud, the fire, all the Old Testament references were all pointing to Jesus Christ. The deliverance out of the bondage of Egypt, all of that, discipleship, everything you see. But those were all shadows. They were all shadows because Jesus is the substance and you're the substance. You're not a shadow. You're not a vapor. You're substance. Colossians in chapter 2, verse 13 says, And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, Jesus has made alive together with him, having forgiven you of all your trespasses. That's the only way we're made alive. We're together with him. Having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and having taken it away, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it, and let no one judge you in terms of your food or your drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of the things to come. Because the substance, say substance. Substance. substance the substance is Christ. The Greek Orthodox religion is, is, does everything in silhouettes. It does everything behind a sheet. But Jesus is not out, he's out in the open, man. He's not behind a sheet. We're not Jews. We're 
in, not shadows, but with substance. We're not darkness, we're light, and we need to know our significance in that. So the four cups of wine at the Passover, they're symbolized by four of God's promises. But the fifth cup is also a promise. We're only going to drink one cup here this evening, and you can do that at your home as well, and that only talk about one. But the Bible only speaks about two. It doesn't talk about all four of them there. And Jesus, in our scripture, only talks about two. In Luke 22, in verse 15, it says, Then he said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. This is the last Passover. Jesus is not going to eat another Passover until you and I eat one with him. I'm talking to you about that in a few moments. He said, then he took the cup. This could have been the first cup or the second cup. We don't really know. And he gave thanks. And he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. This again is the last Passover. And it's the last Passover Jesus is ever going to have. There's one more Passover coming. And I hope you're there. He took the bread and he gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to them. And then he said, this is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. This was a radical departure for Jesus to say these things. They've been saying the same things that are written down for us in Exodus. We're going to look at that in a moment. But this was radically changing their religiosity and moving them out of that. It was blowing their religious minds. Then also, likewise, after... Likewise, he also took the cup after supper. This is the one we're going to take. This is the cup of redemption. Saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Jesus wasn't just doing this as a something to, uh, to, to train the disciples. He knew what was going on here. He was doing it for him, and he understood. He knew what the fifth cup was. He knew what he was about to drink, and he was leading them in this. He wasn't creating another sacrament. He wasn't doing any of that. He was taking them out of the religiosity that had become over the years. Communion is no longer Old Testament symbolism. And it's really getting out of Exodus and out of Egypt. But it's actually a New Testament celebration. Where you and I are so glad we don't have to drink the fifth cup. And I'm going to talk to you about that. You know, the head of the household would repeat those same words for 1,500 years. They would repeat it once a year on that Passover day. And Jesus changed the whole thing. And he wants to do the whole thing in your life. He wants to do the whole thing in my life. He wants to change that. After the first cup of the meal, that first cup is the cup of sanctification. You'll see it here when I read Exodus in chapter 6 and verse 5. It says, Also he heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians will keep in bondage. And I have remembered my covenant. These coming up here are known as the I wills. Notice them. There's seven of them. This is what God will do. He said, I will. And it goes on in verse 6. And you see the first uh, I will. In, in Exodus 6, uh, verse 6, it says, Therefore the children of Israel said, I am the Lord. This is the first cup. I will bring you out. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. That's the sanctification. He's going to separate you. The second cup, you see it again in another I will. I will rescue you and deliver you from their bondage. The third cup, I will redeem you, the cup of redemption. This is the one that we drink tonight. With an outstretched arm and with great judgments. So these are the seven I wills that let God do it. Just let him do what he wants to do in your life. This is God's will. Seven wills, he says, seven I wills, let him do his will. So the first promise is the first cup is to separate you and I from the sin that we're going, the heavy burden of sin. And he wants to reach out and grab us and sanctify us, separate us from our place of slavery. Set you apart. Jesus promises to do that. He promises to get us out. In the book of John, chapter 17 and verse 15, he says, I don't pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. He'll keep you from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. 
As you sent me, I send you into the world. For their sake, I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified by the truth. The second cup is the cup of salvation, redemption rather. The second cup is the cup of redemption. The second cup is the cup of deliverance. God's going to deliver us one of these days soon. <laughs> the second cup is the cup of deliverance. It's to rescue us from the burdens, the heavy burden of sin that he puts on you and I. That devil puts a heavy burden on us. That second cup is for deliverance. The third cup is of redemption. He's not just going to buy you back. Uh, he's just going to buy you back and redeem you. No, that word redemption, it means to buy you back, never to be sold again into slavery. That's the cup that we're going to drink tonight. That's the third cup that Jesus is talking about after supper, the one that he took after supper. And we're going to see that significance. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 12 says, Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, he suffered outside the gate. Therefore let us go forth outside the gate, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city. Thank God for that. <laughs> no continuing city. But we seek one that is to come. Think about Jesus. Think about saying this. Think about all of the legacy, the liturgy that he's changing, the order of service. Think of him. Now I want you to think about the fourth and fifth cup. So let's look at the fourth cup. The fourth cup is the cup of redemption. The fourth cup is the cup of redemption. Cup of rejoicing. I will acquire you. He will redeem you, and he'll protect you. Jesus didn't drink that cup that night, but he made a powerful statement. This is in Exodus in chapter 6 and verse 7. I will take you as my people. Another I will. I will be your God. Another I will. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will bring you in to the land which I swore to give to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and I will give it to you. Seven I wills, let him do his will in your life. Jesus didn't drink that cup, but he made a powerful statement. He made that statement, to, and we don't want to miss it. This is the cup of, cup of protection for them. This was the death angel, the angel of judgment that was coming against their life when they went through Egypt that night. And it killed all of the firstborn, and the Jewish people tonight will drink that cup, that fourth cup they will drink. And the last of the Egyptian gods was finally brought down, and they were let set free. They all that they trusted in, all the false gods were brought down. The miracles that God did just to get us free is amazing to me. Jesus was saying, there's a day that's coming when we will drink of that together. That fourth cup, we'll drink of that together. We'll be home, we'll be away from the angel of death forever. Matthew 26 and verse 26 says, As they were eating, Jesus took the bread, broke it, and gave it to the disciples. And he said, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup. And he gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for the remission of your sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in the Father's kingdom. This is the last supper we're talking about. This is the last uh, Passover Jesus is ever going to eat. He's going to eat another, there's going to be another Passover. You're going to want to be in that Passover. Jesus is speaking to us and he's moving powerfully and giving us a revelation that last supper. This is the cup, the fourth cup of ultimate protection. 
That we'll all be in heaven one day. We won't have to worry about it. That ultimate day of protection will be when we are home in heaven. Never separated from him again. That final protection of the death angel. Jesus was forfeiting that night. That's why he didn't drink it. He was going to meet that death angel in just a few hours from now. All those years back, Jesus is going to walk out of that place. Uh, those disciples didn't understand any more than the ones today. They understand a whole lot either. He, well, they walked out to, and he was forfeiting that protection for in a few hours. He was going to face off that death angel with no protection. And he was going to face that off. Uh, he was going to face the fifth cup with an incredible significance. Every word is inspired by God. And, and from our simplest understanding to the incredible depth of his word to deliver you, he's going to take care of our lives. Great lengths that God goes to, the great length that Jesus goes to, the great length that the word of God goes to is an unimaginable act of compassion that it brings to us. Day in and day out, we're calling for that protection from the death angel. You probably don't even realize how many times God protected you from that death angel. I can think of many times when I should have been dead and burning in hell. And yet even when I didn't know Jesus, he protected me from the death angel. But one day, that death angel is going to have no chance at all. And that final protection, he was forfeiting. He ends the Passover meal without drinking that fourth cup and being prepared to drink the fifth cup. Four powerful promises. I will take you out. I will reach out. I will reach you and I will separate you. That first cup, that sanctification, that's what he's always doing. I will deliver you. That second cup, I will rescue you and then deliver you in that. And then that burden of your slavery, you're out of Egypt and he's going to get the Egypt out of us. How wonderful is that? I will redeem you as the third cup, the one we're drinking tonight. Your redemption. And then he's going to be the fourth cup, who's rejoicing. I will always be with you. The protection, I will protect you. Let me tell you something. Communion is just a little bit more significant than a little bit of grape juice and a little bit of unleavened bread. And some real power in what I'm saying here tonight. The four expressions of the, the rede redemption. Jesus is not just doing this for 12 amazed disciples that are saying, what are you doing? You're changing the whole way that we've been doing this for so long. That's exactly what he wants to do. Change the whole way of what we've been doing for so long. Instead, Jesus was feeling every one of those promises because he was facing every one of those things. His own torture was coming up. He was preparing his own heart for a long night in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was going to be battling through the temptation to do things his own way, his own will. He was going to have to battle through all of that. He was going to have to make a decision to drink the fifth cup. He was doing that for me. He's doing that for you. He was reaching me. He was rescuing me. He was redeeming me. Ultimately, he's rejoicing every time I trust in him. And he knows one day I'm going to have to worry about the angel of death forever. I'm not worried about it now. If I have my way, <laughs> I go home to heaven in a heartbeat. <laughs> Let's finish with one final thought. That's the fifth cup. The fifth cup of redemption. The fifth cup, rather, is God's wrath. Are you listening to me? It's God's wrath. And Jesus would drink that cup that day. One day, the world that has rejected his unimaginable compassion is going to drink that cup. The wrath of God. Jesus would drink the fourth cup and the fifth cup that day. He would defeat the angel of death. And three days later, he'd rise in magnificent glory. And I'll tell you, you've got to look at some powerful descriptions in the Bible about the fifth cup before we finish. And let them resonate in your spirit. Psalm 75 and verse 8 says, For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup. The wine is red. The wine is red. It's fully mixed. He pours it out. Surely its dregs shall all the wicked of the earth drain and drink down. 
Ezekiel chapter 23, verse 33. You will be filled with the drunkenness and sorrow, the cup of horror and desolation, the cup of your sister Samaria. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 15. For thus says the Lord God of Israel to me, take this wine cup of fury from my hand and cause all the nations to whom you send it to, to drink it. And they will drink and stagger. They'll go mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Revelations 14, verse 9. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand, he himself also shall drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into a cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. They have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast in his image, whoever receives the mark of his name. I'm here to tell you that the fifth cup is not something that you and I want to drink of. It's not something uh, that we want to drink of. Uh, it's not something uh, that we want to really fill our lives up with. We've already tasted. <laughs> We've already tasted a very small portion of the wrath of God. Your sin, my sin, has already helped me to taste uh, a little small portion of the wrath of God. He simply lets us. You know what the wrath of God is? It's simply God letting you taste what you want rather than him. Letting you taste what you want rather than him. You know what? It doesn't taste very good. Jason talked about it. It's the fires that he has to keep putting up. Just let you get what you want and you don't want what you got. He simply lets you get your own way and it's a bitter way. It's a sour way. It's a bitter and sour taste. I've never tasted it. You know the amazing thing about it? So we keep on going back to it. That's the amazing thing to me. How many times have you got your way rather than God's way? Was it sweet? Did it taste good? Rejecting all of Jesus' attempts to reach out and separate and rescue and deliver and redeem and rejoice in the protection that he provides over your life. Jesus knew the disciples were going to drink their portion of that cup. They thought they could do it no problem. We all will drink a little of it or a lot. It's not up to us. Matthew chapter 20, verse 21. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit on your right hand and the other on your left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered, he said, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? That third cup, the cup of redemption. And be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. And they said, we are able. So he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup. And be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left, it is not mine to give. But it is for those for whom it is prepared by my Father. You know, self-interest, uh, it ruled right up into the cross. Right up into the crucifixion. Uh, selfies were taking over. Self-interest ruled right then. And it tried to rule after the resurrection. Uh, and it will try to rule today. Uh, but it's always a bitter taste. Let me just close with the fact that Jesus struggled with this fifth cup. Like he never struggled in his life before. The fullness of God's wrath, the fullness of, that he's going to receive all, everything, the fullness of that on every one of us, taken on him. Every sin that has ever been committed, ever will be committed, every sin. I, I, that, that's an amazing burden. He's in the garden. Chapter 26 and verse 38 of the book of Matthew. He said to them, you know what? My soul is exceedingly sorrowful. It's even to the point of death. Will you stay here and watch with me? 
He went a little farther and he fell on his face and he prayed to him, saying, O oh, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, what? <laughs> Exclamation point. Could you not watch with me one hour? Verse 41, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, oh, Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and he found them asleep, for their eyes were heavy. How many times has God found you and I asleep when we should have been up? Pray. How many times? He left them and he went away again and he prayed a third time, saying the same words. Father, this cup, if this cup can't pass away from me, take it from me. But nevertheless, three times he does it. He's probably had to do it more than a few times for me to finally realize what he was talking about. I don't know how many times I might have gone back to sleep when God said, get up, Bruce. You might have to pray a few times before you realize that you don't have to drink the fifth cup. The cup of God's wrath poured out on all evil, filled with the fury of God's judgment for a world that has rejected him. We have four cups of grape juice here. We have four bits of tortilla. It's unleavened bread. Don't get all religious on me. Okay. It's unleavened bread. I looked it up. You might not know. Listen. You think Jesus is that worried about this? Or is he more concerned about what we're talking about tonight? Is he more concerned about how we really view what communion is all about? A celebration that we don't have to take the fifth cup. That we don't have to take that fifth cup. I just can't imagine what the fury of God's life is going to be, of God's judgment is going to be on this earth. For a world that's rejected is unimaginable compassion. That chose to enslave itself to sin. What are the things in life that you get really angry about? How hard is it for you to hold back that anger? How many times have you just let it fly, that anger? How hard is it to hold it back? What kind of destruction did that anger cause in people's lives? We can't even fathom what the fifth cup's going to be like. I got, a, I got a feeling that God has just a little bit of anger in his life. Okay. I, I just, the mercy of God is amazing. The miracles of his mercy is amazing. But it does not cancel out his judgment. You don't have to drink any portion of the fifth cup at all. But I can't even fathom when God lets go and the cup of judgment, the wrath comes upon people who refuse to reach this God that was reaching out, this God that wanted to rescue, this God that wanted to redeem, buy back and never to sell again, this God that wants to rejoice in the protection that he brings to our life. Four cups. But the fifth one you don't want to mess with, man. Jesus drank that fifth cup that day. The full wrath of God was poured out upon him. They actually call that cup Elijah's cup. It's a much larger cup than the other four. And it's in the middle of the table. They put it in the middle of the table. And it's filled right up to the brim. And as they're drinking and they're going through this whole liturgy, this whole order of service, they're watching to see if any of the cup 
or the, the top of the line moves over the edge, that Elijah would come. Because they believe Elijah is going to come and drink the fifth cup. The reason they think it's Elijah that's going to come and drink it is because Elijah is going to be the one that, that is going to announce the Messiah. And that's the one. The, he slaughtered all of the, all the slaughtered false prophets that took place. So it's called the Elijah's cup. It sits in that middle of the table. And those Jewish kids just watch it to see if it quivers just a little bit. But it's not Elijah's cup to drink. Jesus already drank it. And that fifth cup was happened when he shouted, It is finished! You don't have to drink the fifth cup. It's hard to imagine the full extent of the fury that God has held back for millennials. Well, not, sorry, not millennials, <laughs> for millenniums. Sorry, all you millennials. <laughs> You're going to let loose on the earth. Man's pretty evil, man, in his anger. Man is pretty evil in his fury towards others. The sin that is so wicked. Yet Jesus drank that fifth cup. That cup. Cup of fury. They don't drink the fifth cup in the Passover service. We won't drink it tonight. We're going to just drink the third cup. We only have one cup of wine, the cup of redemption. That's what we want to remember. That's what we want to remember tonight. And if you're at home, I hope that you'll do the same thing. Should you just get some unleavened bread? I'm sure you got a tortilla at home. A lot of people got tortillas at home. Or maybe you don't have any grape juice. Maybe you have something else there. Hope you haven't got a bottle of wine anyway, you know. So uh, that's a whole nother sermon. The Passover finished with the host of the house saying, Pour out your wrath on the world, O God. It was poured out on Jesus that day. And one day soon, it's going to be poured out on this whole earth. I want you to bow your heads with me. I want every head bowed and every eye closed just as we're finishing here. We're going to have communion here at this moment. I did my best to try and bring you out of the religiosity of it all. I in no way want to lighten this meaning. I hope the preaching tonight helped you to get a glimpse of something that's there. That God reaches out to us with a cup of sanctification. He delivers us. A cup of deliverance, that second cup. He rescues us, reaches us, rescues us, takes us out, separates us, takes us into him. And then the cup of redemption. That's the one we're going to drink here in the moment. I encourage you to do that at home. I think he's more interested in where your heart's at than what your cups look like. Those are actually shot cups, I think, or communion cups or whatever. There's so much more to God than religion. It's Jesus. The cup of redemption. The cup of protection. Don't you want God's protection on you? Yeah, they might get a vaccine, they might get this, they might, I want God's protection on me. Will you let him protect you? Will you listen to his seven I wills? Just you say God to that? You're here, wherever you are, just pray this prayer with me right now. I want you to say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I come to you as I am. A sinner with no hope except the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus, I believe that you died for me on the cross at Calvary. That they buried you and that you rose again on the third day. I want you to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Help me to forgive others who have sinned against me. Help me to forgive myself for sinning against myself. The sin that so easily besets me. And right now, I receive your love, your acceptance, and your forgiveness. And by the power of your spirit, I 
I'll live my life. Not by my might, not by my power, but by your spirit, which I thankfully receive. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that prayer, then get in touch with us. There's messages on Facebook, there's all kinds of things that people are showing me. But I'll post this also to, to YouTube as well. And uh, there's a lot of information that I don't know how to do online. But uh, I hope you get the information that will bring transformation to your life. You don't have to drink any of that fifth cup. You probably drank way too much of it already. We're going to take communion, and we would invite you to do that. So I'm just going to ask a few that are with me to come and get uh, a cup of grape juice and a bit of unleavened bread. It's a celebration. I am celebrating all of his seven I wills. And we're going to do it uh, just the way Jesus told us to do it. We're going to just pause and think of a few moments. Think about the last Passover. Think about the last supper. Think about the first coming of Jesus. The first communion. Think about it. The second coming of Jesus. And as they were eating, Jesus broke the bread. He blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples. And he said, take and eat. This is my body. The body of Jesus was broken and beaten for your healing. If you need healing in your life right now, communion is about healing. say to you, I won't drink of this until the fruit of the vine, until the day that I drink of it with you and in my Father's kingdom. There's another Passover coming, and you'll sit down with Jesus at the great marriage, land, marriage supper of the Lamb. Now let's drink that cup. Father, right now, in the name of your Son, Jesus, I pray, God, that you move by the power of your Holy Spirit to seal in the hearts of your people, God, that heard this message tonight. To help them to speak it to others. Help them to show it to others, God. The simple truth of, of what communion is about. It's a celebration of life. It's a celebration of being rescued. It's a celebration of being redeemed. It's a celebration, oh God, of being delivered. Oh God, we thank you for your mercy and your grace. Father, help us to live in that life all our lives. We're from the Door Christian Fellowship, the Connor 147th and Crenshaw Boulevard. We're doing these live streams. Uh, as you can see, we're going to make a few mistakes here and there. But one mistake we're not going to make is we're not going to drink any more of that fifth cup.
cup and I need you tonight. And I pray that you won't either. We're going to sing that song, Lift Jesus Higher, and then we'll count ourselves finished for this evening. Now. The Lord bless you. Lift Jesus higher. Lift Jesus higher. Lift him higher.